Book 14. Now Nestor failed not to hear their outcry, though he was drinking his wine, but spoke in winged words to the son of Asclepios, take thought how these things shall be done, brilliant Machaon. Beside the ships the cry of the strong young men grows greater. Now, do you sit here and go on drinking the bright wine, until Hecamede the lovely haired makes ready a hot bath for you, warming it, and washes away the filth of the bloodstains, while I go out and make my way till I find some watch point. So he spoke, and took up the wrought shield of his son Thrasymedes, breaker of horses. It lay in the shelter all shining in bronze. Thrasymedes carried the shield of his father. Then he caught up a powerful spear edged in sharp bronze and stood outside the shelter, and at once saw a shameful action, men driven to flight, and others harrying them in confusion, the great-hearted Trojans, and the wall of the Achaeans overthrown. As when the open sea is deeply stirred to the groundswell but stays in one place and waits the rapid onset of tearing gusts, nor rolls its surf onward in either direction until from Zeus the wind is driven down to decide it, so the aged man pondered, his mind caught between two courses, whether to go among the throng of fast-mounted Danans or in search of Atreus son Agamemnon, shepherd of the people. And in the division of his heart this way seemed best to him, to go after the son of Atreus, while the rest went on with the murderous battle, and the weariless bronze about their bodies was clashing as the men were stabbing with swords and leaf-headed spears. Now there came toward Nestor the kings under God's hand, they who had been wounded by the bronze and came back along the ships, Tydeus' son, and Odysseus, and Atreus' son Agamemnon. For there were ships that had been hauled up far away from the fighting along the beach of the grey sea. They had hauled up the first ones on the plain, and by the sterns of these had built their defences, for, wide as it was, the seashore was not big enough to make room for all the ships, and the people also were straightened, and therefore they had hauled them up in depth, and filled up the long edge of the whole sea coast, all that the two capes compassed between them. These lords walked in a group, each leaning on his spear, to look at the clamorous battle, and for each the heart inside his body was sorrowful, and Nestor the aged man who now met them made still more cast down the spirit inside the Achaeans. Now powerful Agamemnon spoke aloud and addressed him, Nestor, son of Neleus, great glory of the Achaeans, why have you left the fighting where men die, and come back here? I am afraid huge Hector may accomplish that word against me that he spoke, threatening, among the Trojans assembled, that he would not make his way back from the ships toward Ilion until he had set the ships on fire, and killed the men in them. So he spoke then, now all these things are being accomplished. Oh, shame, for I think that all the other strong grieved Achaeans are storing anger against me in their hearts, as Achilles did, and no longer will fight for me by the grounded vessels. Then answered him in turn the Gerenian horseman Nestor, all these things have been brought to fulfilment, nor in any other way could even Zeus who thunders on high accomplish it. For the wall has gone down in which we put our trust, that it would be a protection for our ships and us, and could not be broken, and our men beside the fast ships are fighting incessantly without end, nor could you tell any more, though you looked hard, from which side the Achaeans are broken into confusion, so indiscriminately are they killed, and their crying go skyward. We then must take thought together how these things shall be done if we can do anything for us now. I think that we must not enter the fight, a man cannot fight on when he is wounded. Then in turn the lord of men Agamemnon spoke to him, Nestor, since now they are fighting beside the grounded vessels and the wall we built has done us no good, nor the ditch either where the Danans endured so much, and their hearts were hopeful it would be a protection to their ships and them, and could not be broken, then such is the way it must be pleasing to Zeus, who is too strong, that the Achaeans must die here forgotten and far from Argos. For I knew it, when with full heart he defended the Danans, and I know it now, when he glorifies these people as if they were blessed gods, and has hobbled our warcraft and our hand's strength. Come then, do as I say, let us all be won over, let us take all those ships that are beached near the sea in the first line and haul them down, and row them out on the shining water, and moor them at anchor stones out on the deep water, until the immortal night comes down, if the Trojans will give over fighting for night's sake, then we might haul down all the rest of our vessels. There is no shame in running, even by night, from disaster. The man does better who runs from disaster than he who is caught by it. Then looking darkly at him spoke resourceful Odysseus, son of Atreus, what sort of word escaped your teeth's barrier? Ruinous. I wish you directed some other unworthy army, and were not lord over us, over us to whom Zeus has appointed the accomplishing of wars, from our youth even into our old age until we are dead, each of us. Are you really thus eager to abandon the wide-weighed city of the Trojans, over which we have taken so many sorrows? 
Do not say it, for fear some other Achaean might hear this word, which could never at all get past the lips of any man who understood inside his heart how to speak soundly, who was accepted king, and all the people obeyed him in numbers like those of the Argives, whose lord you are. Now I utterly despise your heart for the thing you have spoken, you who in the very closing of clamorous battle tell us to haul our strong bench ships to the sea, so that even more glory may befall the Trojans, who beat us already, and headlong destruction swing our way, since the Achaeans will not hold their battle as the ships are being hauled seaward, but will look about, and let go the exultation of fighting. There, O leader of the people, your plan will be ruined. Then in turn the lord of men Agamemnon answered him, Odysseus, you have hit me somewhere deep in my feelings with this hard word. But I am not telling the sons of the Achaeans against their will to drag their bent ships down to the water. Now let someone speak who has better counsel than this was, young man or old, and what he says will be to my liking. Now among them spoke Diams of the great war cry, that man is here, we shall not look far for him, if you are willing to listen, and not be each astonished in anger against me because by birth I am the youngest among you. I also can boast that my generation is of an excellent father, Tydeus, whom now the heaped earth covers over in Thabe. For there were three blameless sons who were born to Portheus, and their home was in Pluron and headlong Caledon. Agrios was first, then Melas, and the third was Oeneus the horseman, the father of my father, an invaler beyond the others. But Oeneus stayed in the land, while my father was driven and settled in Argos. Such was the will of Zeus and the other immortals. He married one of the daughters of Adrestos, and established a house rich in substance, and plenty of wheat-grown acres were his, with many orchards of fruit trees circled about him, and many herds were his. He surpassed all other Achaeans with the spear. If all this is true, you must have heard of it. Therefore you could not, saying that I was base and unwarlike by birth, dishna any word that I speak, if I speak well. Let us go back to the fighting wounded as we are. We have to. Once there, we must hold ourselves out of the on four, clear of missiles, so that none will add to the wound he has got already, but we shall be there to drive them on, since even before this they have favoured their anger, and stood far off, and will not fight for us. So he spoke, and they listened well to him, and obeyed him, and went on their way. And the lord of men, Agamemnon, led them. Neither did the glorious shaker of the earth keep blind watch, but came among them now in the likeness of an old man, and took hold of Agamemnon, Atreus' son, by the right hand, and spoke to him and addressed him in winged words, Son of Atreus, I think that now that baleful heart in the breast of Achilles must be happy as he stares at the slaughter of the Achaeans and their defeat. There is no heart in him, not even a little. Even so may the gods strike him down, let him go to destruction. But with you the blessed gods are not utterly angry. There will still be a time when the lords of Troy and their counsellors shall send dust wide on the plain, and you yourself shall look on them as they take flight for their city away from the ships and the shelters. So he spoke, and swept on over the plain, with a huge cry like the yell nine thousand men send up, or ten thousand in battle, as they close in the hateful strife of the war god. So huge was the cry the powerful earthshaker let go from his lungs, and in the heart of every Achaean implanted great strength, to carry the battle on, and fight without flinching. Now Hera, she of the golden throne, standing on Olympo's horn, looked out with her eyes, and saw at once how Poseidon, who was her very brother and her lord's brother, was bustling about the battle where men win glory, and her heart was happy. Then she saw Zeus, sitting along the loftiest summit on Ida of the springs, and in her eyes he was hateful. And now the lady ox-eyed Hera was divided in purpose as to how she could beguile the brain in Zeus of the Aegis. And to her mind this thing appeared to be the best counsel, to array herself in loveliness, and go down to Ida, and perhaps he might be taken with desire to lie in love with her next her skin, and she might be able to drift an innocent warm sleep across his eyelids, and seal his crafty perceptions. She went into her chamber, which her beloved son Hephaestos had built for her, and closed the leaves in the doorpost snugly with a secret door bar, and no other of the gods could open it. There entering she drew shut the leaves of the shining door, then first from her adorable body washed away all stains with ambrosia, and next anointed herself with ambrosial sweet olive oil, which stood there in its fragrance beside her, and from which, stirred in the house of Zeus by the golden pavement, a fragrance was shaken forever forth, on earth and in heaven. 
when with this she had anointed her delicate body and combed her hair, next with her hands she arranged the shining and lovely and ambrosial curls along her immortal head, and dressed in an ambrosial robe that Athene had made her carefully, smooth, and with many figures upon it, and pinned it across her breast with a golden brooch, and circled her waist about with a zone that floated a hundred tassels, and in the lobes of her carefully pierced ears she put rings with triple drops in mulberry. Clusters, radiant with beauty, and, lovely among goddesses, she veiled her head downward with a sweet fresh veil that glimmered pale like the sunlight. Underneath her shining feet she bound on the fair sandals. Now, when she had clothed her body in all this loveliness, she went out from the chamber, and called aside Aphrodite to come away from the rest of the gods, and spoke a word to her, Would you do something for me, dear child, if I were to ask you? Or would you refuse it? Are you forever angered against me because I defend the Danans, while you help the Trojans? Then the daughter of Zeus, Aphrodite, answered her, Hera, honored goddess, daughter to mighty Kronos, speak forth whatever is in your mind. My heart is urgent to do it if I can, and if it is a thing that can be accomplished. Then, with false lying purpose the lady Hera answered her, Give me loveliness and desirability, graces with which you overwhelm mortal men, and all the immortals. Since I go now to the ends of the generous earth, on a visit to Okinos, whence the gods have risen, and Tessis our mother who brought me up kindly in their own house, and cared for me and took me from Rhea, at that time when Zeus of the wide brows drove Kronos underneath the earth and the barren water. I shall go to visit these, and resolve their division of discord, since now for a long time they have stayed apart from each other and from the bed of love, since Rancer has entered their feelings. Could I win over with persuasion the dear heart within them and bring them back to their bed to be merged in love with each other I shall be forever called honoured by them, and beloved. Then in turn Aphrodite the laughing answered her, I cannot, and I must not deny this thing that you ask for, you, who lie in the arms of Zeus, since he is our greatest. She spoke, and from her breasts unbound the elaborate, pattern-pierced zone, and on it are figured all beguilements, and loveliness is figured upon it, and passion of sex is there, and the whispered endearment that steals the heart away even from the thoughtful. She put this in Hera's hands, and called her by name and spoke to her, take this zone, and hide it away in the fold of your bosom. It is elaborate, all things are figured therein. And I think whatever is your heart's desire shall not go unaccomplished. So she spoke, and the ox-eyed lady Hera smiled on her and smiling hid the zone away in the fold of her bosom. So Aphrodite went back into the house, Zeus' daughter, while Hera in a flash of speed left the horn of Olympos and crossed over Pyria and Amathia the lovely and overswept the snowy hills of the Thracian riders and their uttermost pinnacles, nor touched the ground with her feet. Then from Athos she crossed over the heaving main sea and came to Lemnos, and to the city of godlike Thoas. There she encountered sleep, the brother of death. She clung fast to his hand and spoke a word and called him by name, Sleep, Lord over all mortal men and all gods, if ever before now you listen to word of mine, so now also do as I ask, and all my days I shall know gratitude. Put to sleep the shining eyes of Zeus under his brows as soon as I have lain beside him in love. I will give you gifts, a lovely throne, imperishable forever, of gold. My own son, he of the strong arms, Hephaestos, shall make it with careful skill and make for your feet a footstool on which you can rest your shining feet when you take your pleasure. Then sleep the still and soft spoke to her in answer, Hera, honored goddess and daughter of mighty Kronos, any other one of the gods, whose race is immortal, I would lightly put to sleep, even the stream of that river Okinos, whence is risen the seed of all the immortals. But I would not come too close to Zeus, the son of Kronos, nor put him to sleep, unless when he himself were to tell me. Before now, it was a favour to you that taught me wisdom, on the day Heracles, the high-hearted son of Zeus, was sailing from Ilion, when he had utterly sacked the city of the Trojans. That time I laid to sleep the brain in Zeus of the Aegis and drifted upon him still and soft, but your mind was devising evil, and you raised along the sea the blasts of the racking winds, and on these swept him away to Kos, the strong founded, with all his friends lost, but Zeus awakened in anger and beat the gods up and down his house, looking beyond all others for me, and would have sunk me out of sight in the sea from the bright sky had not night who has power over gods and men rescued me. I reached her in my flight, and Zeus let be, though he was angry in awe of doing anything to swift night's displeasure. Now you ask me to do this other impossible thing for you. Then in turn the lady ox-eyed Hera answered him, Sleep, why do you ponder this in your heart, and hesitate? Or do you think that Zeus of the wide brows, aiding the Trojans, will be angry as he was angry for his son, Heracles? 
Come now, do it, and I will give you one of the younger graces for you to marry, and she shall be called your lady, Pasithea, since all your days you have loved her forever. So she spoke, and sleep was pleased and spoke to her in answer, Come then. Swear it to me on stakes, ineluctable water. With one hand take hold of the prospering earth, with the other take hold of the shining salt sea, so that all the undergods who gather about Kronos may be witnesses to us. Swear that you will give me one of the younger graces, Pasithea, the one whom all my days I have longed for. He spoke, nor failed to persuade the goddess Hera of the white arms, and she swore as he commanded, and called by their names on all those gods who live beneath the pit, and who are called Titans. Then when she had sworn this, and made her oath a complete thing, the two went away from Lemnos, and the city of Imbros, and mantled themselves in mist, and made their way very lightly till they came to Ida with all her springs, the mother of wild beasts, to Lecton, where first they left the water, and went on over dry land, and with their feet the top of the forest was shaken. Their sleep stayed, before the eyes of Zeus could light on him, and went up aloft a towering pine tree, the one that grew tallest at that time on Ida, and broke through the close air to the ether. In this he sat, covered over and hidden by the pine branches, in the likeness of a singing bird whom in the mountains the immortal gods call Chalkis, but men call him Kamindis. But Hera light-footed made her way to the peak of Gargaros on towering Ida. And Zeus who gathers the cloud saw her, and when he saw her desire was a mist about his close heart as much as on that time they first went to bed together and lay in love, and their dear parents knew nothing of it. He stood before her and called her by name and spoke to her, Hera, what is your desire that you come down here from Olympos? And your horses are not here, nor your chariot, which you would ride in. Then with false lying purpose the lady Hera answered him, I am going to the ends of the generous earth, on a visit to Okinos, whence the gods have risen, and Tessis our mother, who brought me up kindly in their own house, and cared for me. I shall go to visit these, and resolve their division of discord, since now for a long time they have stayed apart from each other and from the bed of love, since Ransa has entered their feelings. In the foothills by either of the waters are standing my horses, who will carry me over hard land and water. Only now I have come down here from Olympos for your sake so you will not be angry with me afterward, if I have gone silently to the house of deep-running Okinos. Then in turn Zeus who gathers the clouds answered her, Hera, there will be a time afterward when you can go there as well. But now let us go to bed and turn to lovemaking. For never before has love for any goddess or woman so melted about the heart inside me, broken it to submission, as now, not that time when I loved the wife of Ixion who bore me Perithous, equal of the gods in council, nor when I loved Acrisio's daughter, sweet-stepping Danae, who bore Perseus to me, preeminent among all men, nor when I loved the daughter of far-renowned Phoenix, Europa who bore Minos to me, and Radamanthes the godlike, not when I loved Samil, or Alcmene in Thabe, when. Alcmene bore me a son, Heracles the strong-hearted, while Samil's son was Dionysos, the pleasure of mortals, not when I loved the queen Demeter of the lovely tresses, not when it was glorious Leto, nor yourself, so much as now I love you, and the sweet passion has taken hold of me. Then with false lying purpose the lady Hera answered him, Most honoured son of Kronos, what sort of thing have you spoken? If now your great desire is to lie in love together here on the peaks of Ida, everything can be seen. Then what would happen if some one of the gods everlasting saw us sleeping, and went and told all the other immortals of it? I would not simply rise out of bed and go back again, into your house, and such a thing would be shameful. No, if this is your heart's desire, if this is your wish, then there is my chamber, which my beloved son Hephaestos has built for me, and closed the leaves in the doorpost snugly. We can go back there and lie down, since bed is your pleasure. Then in turn Zeus who gathers the clouds answered her, Hera, do not fear that any mortal or any god will see, so close shall be the golden cloud that I gather about us. Not even Aelios can look at us through it, although beyond all others his light has the sharpest vision. So speaking, the son of Kronos caught his wife in his arms. There underneath them the divine earth broke into young, fresh grass, and into dewy clover, crocus and hyacinth so thick and soft it held the hard ground deep away from them. There they lay down together and drew about them a golden wonderful cloud, and from it the glimmering dew descended. So the father slept unshaken on the peak of Gargaron with his wife in his arms, when sleep and passion had stilled him, but gently sleep went on the run to the ships of the Achaeans with a message to tell him who circles the earth and shakes it, Poseidon, and stood close to him and addressed him in winged words, Poseidon, now with all your heart defend the Danans and give them glory, though only for a little, while Zeus still sleeps.
since I have mantled a soft slumber about him and Hero. Beguiled him into sleeping in love beside her. He spoke so, and went away among the famed races of men, and stirred Poseidon even more to defend the Danans. He sprang among their foremost and urged them on in a great voice, Argives, now once more must we give the best of it to Hector, Priam's son, so he may take our ships and win glory from them? Such is his thought and such is his prayer, because now Achilles in the anger of his heart stay still among the hollow ships. But there will not be too much longing for him, if the others of us can stir ourselves up to stand by each other. Come, then, do as I say, let us all be won over, let us take those shields which are best in all the army and biggest and put them on, and cover our heads in the complete shining of helmets, and take in our hands our spears that are longest and go. I myself will lead the way, and I think that no longer Hector, Priam's son, can stand up to us, for all his fury. Let the man stubborn in battle who wears a small shield on his shoulder give it to a worse man, and put on the shield that is bigger. So he spoke, and they listened hard to him, and obeyed him. The kings in person marshalled these men, although they were wounded, Tydeus' son, and Odysseus, and Atreus' son Agamemnon. They went among all, and made them exchange their armour of battle, and the good fighter put on the good armour, and each gave the worse gear to the worse. Then when in the shining bronze they had shrouded their bodies they went forward, and Poseidon the shaker of the earth led them holding in his heavy hand the stark sword with the thin edge glittering, as glitters the thunder flash none may close with by right in sorrowful division, but fear holds all men back. On the other side glorious Hector ordered the Trojans, and now Poseidon of the dark hair and glorious Hector strained to its deadliest the division of battle, the one bringing power to the Trojans, and the god to the Argives. The breaking of the sea washed up to the ships and the shelters of the Argives. The two sides closed together with a great war cry. Not such is the roaring against dry land of the sea surf as it rolls in from the open under the hard blast of the north wind, not such is the bellowing of fire in its blazing in the deep places of the hills when it rises in flaming the forest, nor such again the crying voice of the wind in the deep-haired oaks, when it roars highest in its fury against them. Not so loud as now the noise of Achaeans and Trojans in voice of terror rose as they drove against one another. First glorious Hector made a cast with his spear at Aias since he had turned straight against him, nor missed with his throw but struck, there where over his chest were crossed the two straps, one for the sword with the silver nails, and one for the great shield. These guarded the tenderness of his skin. And Hector, in anger because his weapon had been loosed from his hand in a vain cast, to avoid death shrank into the host of his own companions. But as he drew away huge Telamonian Aias caught up a rock, there were many, holding stones for the fast ships, rolled among the feet of the fighters, he caught up one of these and hit him in the chest next the throat over his shield rim, and spun him around like a top with the stroke, so that he staggered in a circle, as a great oak goes down root torn under Zeus' father's stroke, and a horrible smell of sulphur arises from it, and there is no courage left in a man who stands by and looks on. For the thunderstroke of great Zeus is a hard thing, so Hector in all his strength dropped suddenly in the dust, let fall the spear from his hand, and his shield was beaten upon him, and the helm, and his armor elaborate with bronze clashed over him. Screaming aloud the sons of the Achaeans ran forward in hope to drag him away, and threw their volleying javelins against him, yet no man could stab or cast at the shepherd of the people, sooner the Trojans bravest gathered about him, Aeneas, and Pulidamas, and brilliant Agenor, Sarpedon, lord of the Lycians, and Glaucos the blameless, and of the rest no man was heedless of him, but rather sloped the strong circles of their shields over him, while his companions caught him in their arms out of the fighting and reached his fast-footed horses, where they stood to the rear of the fighting and the battle holding their charioteer and the elaborate chariot, and these carried him, groaning heavily, back toward the city. But when they came to the crossing place of the fair running river, of whirling Xanthos, whose father was Zeus the immortal, they moved him from behind his horses to the ground, and splashed water over him. He got his wind again, and his eyes cleared, and he got up to lean on one knee and vomit a dark clot of blood, then lay back on the ground again, while over both eyes dark night misted. His strength was still broken by the stone stroke. But the Argives, when they saw Hector withdrawing from them, remembered once again their warcraft and turned on the Trojans. There far before them all swift Aias son of Oileus made an outrush, and stabbed with the sharp spear Satnios, Enops' son, whom the perfect Naiad nymph had borne once to Enops, as he tended his herds by Satnios' river. The spear-famed son of Oileus, coming close to this man, stabbed him in the flank so that he knocked him backward, and over him Trojans and Danans closed together in strong encounter. 
Puladamas of the shaken spear came up to stand by him, Panthu's son, and struck in the right shoulder Prathena son of Aurelikos, and the powerful spear was driven through the shoulder, and he dropping in the dust clawed the ground in his fingers. Puladamas vaunted terribly over him, calling in a great voice, I think this javelin leaping from the heavy hand of Panthu's high-hearted son was not thrown away in a vain cast. Rather some Argive caught it in his skin. I think he has got it for a stick to lean on as he trudges down into death's house. He spoke, and sorrow came over the Argives at his vaunting, and beyond others he stirred the anger in wise Telamonian Ias, for the man had fallen closest to him, and at once he made a cast with the shining spear at returning Pulidamas. But Pulidamas himself avoided the dark death with a quick spring to one side, and Archilocho son of Antinor caught the spear, since the immortal gods had doomed his destruction. He hit him at the joining place of head and neck, at the last vertebra, and cut through both of the tendons, so that the man's head and mouth and nose hit the ground far sooner than did the front of his legs and knees as he fell. And Aya spoke aloud in answer to unfaulted Puladamas, think over this, Puladamas, and answer me truly. Is not this man's death against Prathenas a worthwhile exchange? I think he is no mean man, nor born of mean fathers, but is some brother of Antinor, breaker of horses, or his son, since he is close in blood by the look of him. He spoke, knowing well what he said, and sorrow fastened on the Trojans. There are karmas, bestriding his brother, stabbed the Boeotian Pramachos with the spear as he tried to drag off the body. Akamas vaunted terribly over him, calling in a great voice, You Argives, arrow fighters, insatiate of menace. I think we shall not be the only ones to be given hard work and sorrow, but you too must sometimes die, as this man did. Think how Pramacho sleeps among you, beaten down under my spear, so that punishment for my brother may not go long unpaid. Therefore a man prays he will leave behind him one close to him in his halls to avenge his downfall in battle. He spoke, and sorrow came over the Argives at his vaunting, and beyond others he stirred the anger in wise Penelios. He charged Akamas, who would not stand up against the onset of Lord Penelios. He then stabbed with the spear Ilioneus the son of Forbes the rich in sheep flocks, whom beyond all men of the Trojans Hermes loved, and gave him possessions. Ilioneus was the only child his mother had borne him. This man Penelios caught underneath the brow, at the bases of the eye, and pushed the eyeball out, and the spear went clean through the eye socket and tendon of the neck, so that he went down backward, reaching out both hands, but Penelios drawing his sharp sword hewed at the neck in the middle, and so dashed down with the head, with helm upon it, while still on the point of the big spear the eyeball stuck. He, lifting it high like the head of a poppy, displayed it to the Trojans and spoke vaunting over it, Trojans, tell haughty Ilioneus beloved father and mother, from me, that they can weep for him in their halls, since neither shall the wife of Promachos, a legend a son, take pride of delight in her dear lord's coming, on that day when we sons of the Achaeans come home from Troy in our vessels. So he spoke, and the shivers came over the limbs of all of them, and each man looked about him for a way to escape the sheer death. Tell me now, you muses who have your homes on Olympos, who was first of the Achaeans to win the bloody despoilment of men, when the glorious shaker of the earth bent the way of the battle. First Telamonian Ias cut down Hercios, he who was son to Gertios, and lord over the strong-hearted Mysians. Antilocho slaughtered forks and murmuros. Morris and Hippotion were killed by Meriones. Two crows cut down Periphetes and Prathun. Next the son of Atreus, Menelos, stabbed Hyperina, shepherd of the people, in the flank, so the bronze head let gush out the entrails through the torn side. His life came out through the wound of the spear stab in beating haste, and a mist of darkness closed over both eyes. But Aias the fast-footed son of Oileus caught and killed most, since there was none like him in the speed of his feet to go after men who ran, once Zeus had driven the terror upon them.